special event that occurred today, and that is uh, it is the birthday of Mrs. Armand Hammer. So we would like to wish her a happy birthday, Francis. <laughs> Once again, uh, Bill Lyon, I'll him over to, to Bill Lyon, who will take over from here. Bill? Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Mr. President, Mrs. Reagan, of course, this is a great uh, day for all of us, I think, here. It's been a beautiful day, a beautiful luncheon together, and a chance to be together. And I would say that uh, I think Willadine and I are most delighted that uh, our children and grandchildren have had the opportunity to meet and be with uh, the President and Mrs. Reagan. Uh, I thought it would be inappropriate today if I talked about how great things have been with this great President and Mrs. Reagan for the past seven plus years. I don't think I should talk about how much interest rates have gone down. <laughs> and I don't think I should mention about how inflation has gone down or how unemployment has gone down. Uh, but I do want to talk to you about one piece of positively the most important piece of trivia that you will ever hear in your life. And that was, when I was graduating from high school, when I grew up, uh, when I grew up, uh, we couldn't afford middle names, so I didn't, I wasn't blessed with a middle name. <laughs> and when affection that all of us have for the President, Mrs. Reagan, and what they've done for us long before as governor, and then the presidency for these seven plus years has been unbelievable in changing the direction of this country. And uh, I'm just delighted to have the opportunity to present to you the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. President. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Please. Well, again, in addition to what Bill Smith said, I think all of us are so grateful to General William Ronald Lyon <laughs> and his lovely wife for this particular occasion here. I want to tell you, when you just told that little story, I pinched myself because I thought that you only got somebody named after you, you were dead. Uh, <laughs> I, <clears throat> on occasion, I've tried to reassure some audiences that they won't, I won't keep them here too long. There are a few stories that illustrate the problems with that. It's, I will make it like Henry VIII said to each of his six wives, I won't keep you long. <laughs> As you know, there's another story about that of the day in the ancient Colosseum in Rome. Caesar and all of the multitude was there, and the little huddle of sacrifices were down there in the midst, and then the 12 hungry lions were turned loose to come roaring down on them, and one fellow stepped out of the little group huddled there and said something quietly to the lions, and they all laid down. Well, the crowd was furious that they weren't going to see the show they'd paid to see, and and Caesar was, he had him sent for him, bring that man up here. And when he came up, he said, I want to know what is it that you said to them that made them act like that? He said, I just told them that after they ate, there'd be speeches. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't tell you, Nancy and I are, well, first of all, we're just happy to be here. To any of you who haven't done it, let me warn you that when you decide that you want to live for any length of period of time away from California, you will live in a perpetual state of homesickness. <laughs> and, uh, and we feel that way, and it's such a joy to be here and to be among old friends and hopefully to be making some new friends. The, the cause that brings you here, I've had a hard time getting over some self-consciousness about talking about it because it 
sounds like it's kind of an ego trip or something, a library in your name and for uh, encompassing the job that you've had for eight years or, or so. But in reality, I make myself look at it the way what it really is. And that is that these presidential libraries are an important fact, part of keeping available to the people of the land the history of this nation and not according to what you read in the Morning Times, that, it, that you can get the innermost secrets and have the papers, and that will be true of all of ours. And sometimes with the flood of letters that comes in, and I don't get to see them all, you couldn't possibly read them all, but a sizable package are sent to me so that I have an idea of what, uh, what is, on the, uh, is on the people's minds. And some of the questions are, I mean, some of the letters are so wonderful. Uh, some of them a very great human problem, and that's when I look for Fred Ryan and turn this over to him, and our private sector initiative has been able to do something for these people and whatever it required. This, I think, is new in our government, the private sector initiative. Uh, I really got the idea sitting uh, beside an ambassador's wife of a European country. I won't embarrass them by naming her. But at our table, the conversation had gotten around to something, one of the great charitable things that's going on in our country and that we accept that is done in the various things like Easter seals or whatever. And very quietly, she said to me, in your country, yes. And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, she said, you're unique. She said, in all the other countries, including our own, she said, the government does these things, not privately as you do in your country. Well, we started a private sector initiative to find out how many things we, where we could help. And I think, Fred, and I'll know by the expression on your face if I'm telling the truth, I think we have in the computer over there now something like 3,000 programs. He said yes. 3,000 programs that where in some community uh, they have found a way to solve a problem at the private level, not turning to government and yelling for help. As this lady had said to me, the government always did these things. And so if someone has a problem in their community, they can contact our private sector initiative. And they can ask about this. And he can put them in touch with any number of people in communities around the country that have already solved that problem in their community and how they did it. And they can actually contact the people for help in setting it up in their own community. And just a short time ago, there was a meeting in Paris, France. And that meeting, there were Americans attending there. They were all participants in private sector initiatives in our country. And this was a meeting brought about by European countries that wanted to learn how do we do it. And we went over, and today, private sector thing are in every one of those countries. And when we went to the economic summit in Vienna, no, I mean Venice, <laughs> I always get the wrong country there. In Venice, I left one of our meetings to go over and appear at a group that was meeting, and I looked at some familiar American faces out there in the group. Yes, this was Italy, setting up their entire private sector plan. Last year, you people, the people of America, you contributed to education, to charity, to good deeds, to all kinds of worthwhile programs, $84 billion. If the federal government had tried to do all those things instead, it would be $840 billion. But, uh, yes, you can. Well, I'm talking longer than I intend to do because I want to get back to what I started on, and that was this library. That all of this and all of the records and all of those, th that lo those letters, that personal correspondence and so forth, all of that will be available for scholars and for people interested who want to come and find out uh, what really did happen uh, with regard to some of the things that are portrayed in, uh, in the media. And so it is a worthwhile, a worthwhile thing that I think perpetuates what we have in this country that is so unique. You can't understand the thrill it is to stand up in front of a student audience and talk to them about the Constitution. And 
they're looking a little vague at you when you tell them that there's every country in the world's got a constitution. I've read, I've read the Soviet constitution. It's got a lot of the same things about right to assemble and so forth these others have. And then I'm able to say to them, but the difference between our constitution and all those other countries' constitutions is so tiny, it's overlooked, but it is so great it tells the whole story and is done in three words, we the people. All those other constitutions are documents in which the government tells the people of those countries what they can do. Our constitution is by the people and tells the government what it can do, and it can do nothing other than what is prescribed in that constitution. And uh, it does get their attention a little bit. But the fact that you are so willing to help and to be a, a part of this movement and those that you have been introduced to you as participating on the, on the staff and all, it, it isn't just a compliment to a, an individual. You know, some people think they become president. You don't, really. You're given temporary custody over an institution called the presidency. And it's a very great honor, but at the same time, it's a very great responsibility. And then this record will be there forevermore, unchangeable, in the original documents and all the information on all that took place. And I've talked a lot longer than I intended to talk and, and should have talked, but uh, Sometimes you get a question about, is it fun, and, and do you enjoy being president? In moments like this, hell yes. <laughs> but then you remember every once in a while when you're back in Washington what Lincoln said about the road to hell. He said it's only a mile long down to a building with a dome on top of it. <laughs> Somebody, somebody once accused Lincoln of being too f ready with jokes and so forth and laughter for the serious office that he held, and Lincoln answered them very properly. He said, if I couldn't laugh, I couldn't stand this job for 15 minutes. <laughs> so, so uh, well, I'm trying to think of a good get-off line here, but I, <laughs> I don't. Yes, I do have, have one. Our Secret Service agents uh, sent me as a, as a birthday gift a book, and it is a compendium of everything Irish. And it's got songs, it's got poems, it's got uh, stories and true stories and jokes that they tell and everything of the Irish. And one was a true incident of a little Irish girl, six years old, who came home from school with a note from the teacher, and she'd been naughty. And that night at dinner, the family gathered around the dining table, but she was at a little table with her back to them over in the corner of the room for being naughty. And then they overheard her saying grace. And pardon me, Reverend, for this. They heard her saying, thank thee, Lord Jesus, for preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> The last time I told that story was at the Speaker of the Congress, Jim Wright's table in the little party that he gives for St. Patrick's Day. And I was invited there and I had to say a few words. And looking around my table at Teddy Kennedy and a few other individuals, I thought it would be suitable to tell that story. Thank you all very much.